London, one of the busiest cities in the world. But if I'd been here in September 1666, I'd have been walking through the heart of a terrible inferno, surrounded by chaos and panic. The capital was in flames. 350 years ago, the Great Fire raged for four days and nights. The streets below us would have been a scene of utter carnage, as nearly all the buildings in the city of London were destroyed. In our last programme, we investigated the start of the fire, and with the help of some new research, we found precisely where the bakery was, where it all began. Exactly here. And that is quite amazing. This time we'll be following the trail of devastation as the blaze spreads even further, claiming all the important buildings in the city. Nearly a thousand homes and shops were destroyed on day one of the fire, but on days two and three, there was much worse to follow. I'll be walking the route of the Great Fire on its second and third days, finding out how people fought to stop it every step of the way. Oh, wow, look at them go. New research will uncover how the flames were able to spring up like wildfire all over London. Oh, there we go. Now we've got fire. We'll see how Londoners turned against each other, looking for someone to blame. They really are the bakers from hell, aren't they? And underground, I discover the lost remains of St Paul's from 1666. We can see something no one gets a chance to see, the pillars of medieval St Paul's. This is the Great Fire. fire began in the Pudding Lane area in the early hours of Sunday, September the 2nd, 1666, and quickly spread south, devouring the poorer areas and the quayside. But now, on Monday, the second day of the fire, it's moving here, towards Gracechurch Street, one of the most glamorous parts of the city. Gracechurch Street is wiped out within a few hours, and the fire keeps heading north, towards the heart of the financial district. Lombard Street and the Royal Exchange. If they go up in flames, London's economy is in serious trouble. Susanna and Rob are exploring how Londoners from every walk of life were caught up in the flames. People are in a state of panic. The city's in chaos. And here at Newgate, one of the seven London gates leading in and out of the city, there are huge bottlenecks as people desperately attempt to flee the inferno. Early on Monday, all entrances to the city are closed to incoming traffic to help more people to escape. As it spreads, the fire makes no allowance for class or wealth. Everyone, rich or poor, is under threat. Across the series, I'm following three Londoners, a bookseller, a shoemaker and a banker, all living in different parts of this great city. On Monday early afternoon, the flames are reaching wealthy Lombard Street and our first Londoner is now being caught up in the raging fire. The narrow, twisting road made it easy for the fire to burn towards his elegant residence. Robert Vino was a wealthy banker and goldsmith, and one of the most influential men in England. Friends with the king, he even made some of the famous crown jewels. His home was now in serious danger. Vino, ever the cautious banker, took action 24 hours before the fire reached his house in Lombard Street. He had his business papers, jewelry and cash moved out of his house and taken to be stored over 20 miles away at the King's Palace at Windsor Castle. In a terrifying couple of hours, Viner lost his home, business and his entire neighbourhood. The only comfort was knowing that at least his family was safe. He also managed to save his jewels and his documents holding details of the many debtors who owed him money. But the Great Fire wasn't done with him yet. Rich Londoners like Robert Viner had the most to lose, but they also had the cash to pay other people to get their stuff out of harm's way. Now, not everyone was that lucky. 
Poorer people just had to grab whatever they could in their arms or stick it on a cart and flee. It would have been absolute chaos. People running in every direction, trying to save themselves, trying to save their belongings, as behind them, the fire spread remorselessly, swallowing up homes and swallowing up businesses. North of Lombard Street, just seven streets away from where the fire started, was the financial and commercial heart of London, the Royal Exchange. Now, in a matter of moments, it too was consumed by the fire, and 3,000 merchants, selling everything from Chinese silks to gold cloth and jewels, had their livelihoods destroyed. For a while, a strange and exotic smell is rising up from the crypt here, and that's because this is where the East India Company keeps its huge stocks of very expensive spices, and that smell, which is sticking to the back of people's throats, well, that's all of their pepper burning. I want to know why the destruction of the Royal Exchange on Monday afternoon was such a devastating blow for the city. So I'm meeting Professor Ronald Hutton, who's an expert in the period. Ronald, here we are in the Royal Exchange. What would this place have been like in 1666? Think of a mixture of a gigantic shopping mall, a gigantic stock exchange, and a gigantic business park, and surrounding it, one of the great manufacturing areas of the land, especially for luxury goods, high-quality produce. It burned down in the Great Fire. What was the effect of that on London's economy? It's the place to which everybody comes to move money and goods around in London and the nation. And was it just London's rich who were affected, or was it the poor as well? The Royal Exchange is the motor of the economy, and the economy affects absolutely everybody. The poor lose their jobs, and the economy takes a spin dive, just as the rich lose their capital. So it's everybody. Just imagine at the present day, the Bank of England, the Stock Exchange, and most of the merchant banks all going up in smoke in a day, and you have some sense of the impact. So the jobs and the produce of the poor are on the line, as well as the money of the rich. Monday, the second day of the fire, has come to an end. By nightfall, scraps of scorched silk travel on the strong wind 30 miles west to Beaconsfield, and smoke spreads 50 miles to Oxford. Writer Samuel Pepys reports the front line of the fire is now a mile wide. After the break, we see how on the next day, London's top luxury shops turn to smoking ruins. The blaze overtakes so much of the city that the only man who can save it is the king himself. It's dawn on the third day of the Great Fire of London. I'm walking in the footsteps of the fire, uncovering the facts behind Britain's most devastating inferno. The first two days, Sunday and Monday, destroyed almost half of the city's buildings. But worse is to come. It's now morning on Tuesday the 4th of September, day three of the Great Fire, and the day it's destined to cause its most terrible damage. The fire keeps heading remorselessly westwards, blown by the powerful wind. At dawn, it came here to Cheapside, the city's most fashionable road. This was the capital's top high street, packed with traders, merchants and famous taverns. In 1666, just like today, this street, Cheapside, was full of shops. In fact, the name Cheap comes from the old English word meaning market. And as well as being the centre of London's jewellery trade, this was also its busiest shopping area, with a thriving market selling cheese and butter and herbs and fruits, both here and in neighbouring side streets. But early on Tuesday morning, no one's shopping here. All they want to do is save their lives and possessions before the fire gets to them. From St Paul's, our second Londoner, bookseller Joshua Curtin, can actually see the blaze approaching. He's rapidly packing his entire stock of books to take them to safety. The fire's now completely out of control, with around 100 houses going up in flames every hour. Buildings are burning in all directions, and eyewitness accounts tell us the wall of fire is over 30 feet high. Having started in the very south of the city and spread west to Cheapside, the fire's also now reaching the north side of the city wall. 
It's now 6.30 a.m. on Tuesday, the third day of the fire. Cheapside is fully ablaze, and by the Thames, the fire's coming ever closer to the temple. On the previous day, Londoners lost an important battle on the riverfront when it advanced towards Blackfriars. Here at Queen High, there would have been absolute chaos. Up there, you'd have seen people fleeing the city with their belongings in their arms or on carts, while down here, others would have been running desperately to the river to gather water in a futile attempt to put out the flames. And remember, all this could have been avoided. The city's Lord Mayor had the chance to stop the fire in its first few hours. But instead of action, he said a woman could piss it out. Now people desperately needed someone to get things under control. Step forward this man, the King, Charles II. Charles takes charge and orders eight command posts to be set up on the western side of the city, where the fire is rapidly headed. Each is responsible for protecting its local area. As the inferno spread across the city, the King and his brother, the Duke of York, took a boat downriver here to Queen Hive and they threw themselves into tackling the blaze, passing water buckets, helping to operate primitive fire engines and inspiring the firefighters. And we know from eyewitness accounts that this really impressed the King's subjects, which was good news for Charles because he needed his people on his side. By the time of the fire, Charles had been king for six years, returning the monarchy to England after his father, Charles I, was beheaded in 1649. But in these six years, he'd only really proved himself in the arts of gambling and womanising, entertaining his mistresses and drinking buddies here in the undercroft of the banqueting house. Scandal followed scandal. He would have been a tabloid editor's dream. Now, I love Charles. There never seemed to be a dull moment when he was around. He might not be the sort of person you'd want to hang out with your daughter, You'd sure as hell have a good time. But that wasn't exactly the mood in 17th century London. A hedonistic party animal always looking for fun wasn't what people wanted in a king. They wanted someone whose finger was on the pulse, someone who could give the country what it needed. He'd certainly failed a year earlier when London was struck by a devastating plague. Charles's response wasn't to stay and help, Instead, he packed up his things and left the city. Charles's behaviour during the plague was widely criticised, and by 1666, his reputation was at breaking point. So when the Great Fire came along, rather than leave London and issue orders from afar, he decided to stay and fight, seizing it as the PR opportunity of a lifetime. This was Charles II's chance to show himself as a man of action who put his people first. It's still early in the morning on the third day of the fire. The blaze is ferocious and continues to grow in all directions. By 7 a.m., the fire's moved further north and already some of the city's most magnificent medieval buildings have been destroyed, some of them more than 300 years old. Grocer's Hall is in ruins, Draper's Hall is gone, and then the fire reaches here, Merchant Taylor's Hall. These buildings were some of the most sumptuous in London and belonged to livery companies, incredibly wealthy organisations that were key to London's business life. Livery companies were trade and craft guilds, and they originally existed to make sure that only members of a particular company could practice a particular trade. So, for example, if you were a member of this company, Merchant Tailors, then you could work as a tailor and make clothes. Because of their vast wealth, the livery companies also lent money to the king, which gave them even more political influence. When they go up in flames, the city's economy suffers another great loss. Treat yourself to the best gift in history this holiday season. Enjoy unlimited access to award-winning podcasts and thousands of hours of original history documentaries released weekly exclusively on History Hit. There are topics for all history lovers, from Pompeii to D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description 
for an exclusive discount. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to explore the past like never before with History Hit. As the fire devoured the buildings that were the lifeblood of the city, people desperately tried to fight the flames, but the fire seemed to leap ahead of them. Now, a strong wind had been blowing since the beginning of the fire, and contemporary accounts say the flames seemed to leap from building to building, often as much as half a mile at a time. To find out the real answer why the Great Fire was spreading so rapidly and why new fires were breaking out all over London, I'm heading to Imperial College. One of the world's most renowned fire specialists, Dr. Guillermo Rain, has been doing brand new research about the connection between wildfires and the Great Fire of London. From studying wildfires, forest fires, we know that in the presence of a wind, uh, when the flames are very large, the production of embers become a major source of fire spread. Embers are small pieces of burning debris that can be blown from building to building. We know that the first three days of the fire were very windy, and the wind carried embers across London, starting fires in distant places, just like wildfires. So this is something unique about the Great Fire of London, that it was a fire that was so large that the fire saw the city as a, as a, as a forest, literally. Really? Yeah. To demonstrate how embers could spread the fire far and wide across London's rooftops, Dr. Rain has created two models of the clay roofs commonly found in 1666. The one on the right has good intact roof tiles. The other is damaged and broken, and you can see the wooden slats underneath. Many houses would have been hundreds of years old, and the damaged roofs especially would have been very easy prey to embers. At the time where the Great Fire of London really was prolific was quite a poor area of London, so the houses would have been not well maintained, almost slum-like. I want to find out just how quickly the wind-blown embers started new fires once they landed on roofs. Dr. Rain has his own ember generator called the Imperial Dragon. This replicates the way that embers would have been fanned and carried by the wind during the Great Fire. Oh, wow, it's straight away. Look at them go. These aren't sparks. These are embers, and, and there's a difference there. Yeah, yeah. Because an ember still has a certain amount of fuel in itself, does it? Exactly. The embers bounce off the intact tiles, leaving the roof undamaged, but the gaps in the broken tiles on the left let the embers in. Some of them are sneaking in those tiny little gaps, aren't they? So you can see the very small embers, they just land there and they stay there unignited. Within minutes, the roof with the broken tiles and the revealed wooden slats is on fire. Oh, there we go. There go. It's up. Yeah. Now we've got fire. And now the fire will develop into the house and the whole building will be engulfed in fire. Given the huge spread of the Great Fire, there would have been countless embers flying about, starting new fires constantly. To make matters worse, the strong wind blowing at the time leads Dr. Rain to estimate these embers could be carried hundreds of metres from their point of origin. It's terrifying, isn't it, thinking that you were possibly safe because you were that far away from the main fire, but actually you may very well have had a ticking time bomb lodged in your roof. Yeah. It's now noon on day three of the Great Fire, and eyewitnesses tell us that the city is covered in a huge cloud of smoke. In fact, if you can see the sun through it, it looks as red as blood. The King's brother, the Duke of York, has set up a command centre here at Bridewell, but already embers are falling all around him. He's soon surrounded by fire and almost overcome. He has no choice but to order his men to flee. In fact, he's lucky to get away alive. And all around him, the city is falling into chaos. But the Duke of York was a trained soldier and well used to dealing with extreme situations. Your everyday Londoner, however, was not. Families were caught up in a living nightmare and by the third day of the fire, the city was in a frenzy of madness and hysteria. One witness says he saw women and children shrieking in fright and people running around like distracted creatures. Another account says that Londoners were seized with dread. 
What I find amazing from looking at these images and reading survivors' accounts is that people don't seem to have behaved any differently to the way that we would do now. We know of individuals even refusing to leave their houses and others whose brains just seem to shut down, leaving them helpless against the flames. Dr. Sarita Robinson has been studying people's reactions to traumatic experiences. This is a case of what we would call cognitive paralysis, and this is when people become so overwhelmed by what's going on around them that they can't actually process the information and form a rational behaviour, and therefore we just grind to a halt. There's actually one story of an 80-year-old watchmaker who sits in his workshop and refuses to leave. In fact, they find his bones with his keys. Yes, in the case of your watchmaker, then actually what we're seeing is uh, some sort of denial behaviours, perhaps. They don't believe that they're going to be consumed by the fire. So, in other words, what's going on, it's a form of psychological comfort to people just to stay put mm. and not think about the fire, although, as you say, th these consequences were fatal. It's now 1pm on Tuesday afternoon, and the fire has been raging for over three days. With so many people terrified, paralysed or running around, there were bound to be a few chances. Amid the mayhem, one of the greatest dangers to what remained of public order was the prisons. And here, where the Old Bailey stands today, was one of London's most famous jails. It was called Newgate. And as the fire spread, an armed guard marched the prisoners out of Newgate and took them south to safety in Southwark. But of course, some of the prisoners saw this as their perfect opportunity to make an escape, and they scarpered in all directions. Well into the third day of the fire, many other dodgy Londoners exploited the situation by looting. To find out why crimes like these became rife during the Great Fire, I'm meeting Rebecca Redeal, who has researched the subject extensively. Rebecca, what I'm really interested in is the fact there's so many petty crimes during the fire. Have you come across them a lot? Yes, um, and the stories are always um, quite hilarious, actually. So you get people grabbing goods like tobacco, like brandy. They were goods that anyone could really buy, but they were slightly luxurious as well. Um, it wasn't like buying a loaf of bread. Um, it wasn't a necessity. So if you saw a tobacco shop that was vacant and clearly nobody was there, lots of people would have just picked up these goods. So it's like the London riots, isn't it, where people were sort of helping themselves? Yeah, order has broken down so much that they don't think that they're going to get caught because actually the maximum punishment for stealing anything over a shilling was death. If there were a vast quantity of people committing petty crimes, how were the authorities going to deal with it? You can't round up the whole of London. No, you can't. So what they did instead was a proclamation was issued on the 19th of September, which basically said, if you've taken anything, whether intentionally or not, um, just drop it off at Finsbury Park and we'll say no more about it. The looters might have got off lightly, but these were extraordinary times. In such terrible circumstances, who's to say that we would have behaved any differently? It's now 1.30pm on the third day of the fire, and desperate Londoners are trying new methods to halt its progress. They start using gunpowder, but in other parts of the city, the fire rages on. After the break, we'll be heading to St Paul's Cathedral to find out just how incredibly hot the Great Fire got. So hot, it even brought down the house of God. We're exploring the Great Fire of London, uncovering its secrets and feeling the heat behind the most terrible blaze in British history. I'm walking the route of the fire every step of the way, tracing its trail of devastation through the city from east to west. It's Tuesday the 4th of September the third day of the fire. By the afternoon, the blaze reaches Ludgate Hill, encircling the area at the top, the spiritual heart of the city. Here at the top of Ludgate Hill is the most significant building in the whole city, more important than the livery company halls, more important than the Royal Exchange. It's London's very own cathedral. 
St Paul's. And on the third day of the fire, the flames are getting closer and closer. The old medieval St Paul's had been standing for almost 600 years. That's longer than the rebuilt St Paul's we have today. It was not only a place of worship, but also a bustling hub for business. At the time of the Great Fire, St Paul's was the centre of England's book trade. Joshua Curtin was a well-known bookseller who counted Samuel Pepys among his customers. He'd been trading for many years and had a booming business. When news of the fire broke, the booksellers, printers and stationers in this area were deeply anxious, and understandably so. They were surrounded by stacks and stacks of flammable materials, books, rolls of parchment and countless prints and pamphlets. And those flammable materials were their livelihood. Desperate to save their stock, the booksellers decided to hide everything underground inside St Paul's crypt. Thousands and thousands of books were rushed into the building. Joshua was allocated a spot over here. And over the course of two panic-stricken days, he heaved all of his books inside to safety. Or so he thought. The booksellers thought the crypt was impregnable, but the cathedral was being repaired and was covered in wooden scaffolding. Tragically, the scaffolding caught fire and St Paul's went up in flames. The fire around the cathedral was so hot that the very stones exploded like grenades. But Joshua might still have hoped that at least the crypt would be safe. That is until, as one eyewitness put it, great beams and massy stones fell on the pavement and broke through into the crypt, destroying all the books. Curtin had lost everything. With the great cathedral now in flames, our third Londoner is also within reach of the fire. Living only a few streets away at Christ Hospital School, Sybil Tame will soon need to take her daughters to safety. Everywhere around here, buildings are on fire. St Paul's School has burned to the ground. Stationers Hall, that's burned to the ground. The Royal College of Physicians at Amen Corner, that's burned to the ground. And still the wind continues to blow, fanning the flames. The fires now reach the point that firefighters call fully developed. It's at its hottest and it's most dangerous. To bring down a stone colossus like St Paul's, the fire must have been incredibly hot. Museum of London Archaeology has in its collection objects that hold clues to the intense temperatures the fire reached. I'm meeting lead archaeologist Gustav Milne. Gus, what have we got here? What we have is some material from a building right next to the bakehouse where the fire started. This is a red brick, or was a red brick, from the cellar floor of that basement. And as you can see, it's a little bit black. What does that actually tell us? It was a storage cell, it was a warehouse in which barrels of wood pitch were being stored. Pitch was used on wooden boats and houses to waterproof them and stop them from rotting. The problem with pitch, it's combustible. And what's happened is the wood pitch has boiled and percolated all the way through the bricks. So for, for pitch to have, have melted then? That's at least 250 to 300 degrees. Also discovered in the storage cellar were barrels with distorted metalwork, which points to even higher temperatures. For the bottom of the barrels to be carbonized like that, you'd have to have a temperature about 700 degrees. Oh, wow. We've quickly ramped up yes. temperatures, haven't Yes, they? yes. In fact, the temperature got so high that the metal not only got distorted, it actually melted. Now, this is a padlock that was discovered by archaeologists and dated back to the time of the Great Fire of London. Now, this would have been made of iron, and you can see the damage on that, and that's fire damage. And to distort the metal like it has done there, the temperatures involved would have been phenomenal. I want to test exactly how great a temperature would have deformed this padlock so much, and so find out how hot the Great Fire became. 
I've enlisted the help of Eirik Christensen from Imperial College London and Robin Williams, a blacksmith. I've got a padlock here. So can we use the forge here to see what we can do with this padlock? Yes, yeah, certainly, yeah. Eirik, you've got a complicated-looking thermometer here, is it? That's essentially exactly it. It's a temperature um, probe that can go to really high temperatures. This state-of-the-art piece of kit can read temperatures over 1,000 degrees. So it's time to find out what temperature will melt the padlock. So I'm just going to pop that there on the top. Let's see what happens, shall we? I've got Richard behind me here who's pumping the bellows, which is blowing air into our fire, which is giving it all it needs to get up to really, really high temperatures. It's representative of what was going on at the Great Fire London because of the, the enormous winds that were going, the amount of fuel that was available. We take a reading after a few minutes. Despite the heat, the padlock looks intact. Look at that glowing oh, away. Goodness that's me. That's a gorgeous colour. What do you up there now, Eric? We're over 700 degrees, closer to 800 degrees. 800 degrees. Oh, look at it glow. Woo! Right, let's get it in again. The padlock is very hot, but not deformed like the one found in the Great Fire ruins. So we increase the temperature. Right, let's pull that out. OK, right, let's have a look at this. Whoa! Oh, look at that. Right, Eric, what, what are we at there? So we are just oh, shooting, shooting well above 1,000 degrees right there. It's melted and metal's burnt. We've burnt a hole but through the iron there. You certainly we? have. Goodness me. We've managed to kind of replicate the padlock that was retrieved. You yeah. can see the kind of temperatures we're talking about. And we were, we were over 1,000 degrees to yeah, get we that. Were... I mean, that is ruined, isn't it? That's, that's horrific. Our tests have confirmed that temperatures during the Great Fire reached over 1,000 degrees, enough to destroy the strongest of building materials like stone and iron, and hot enough to devour St. Paul's. When St. Paul's burned down, the air was so hot, a local thunderstorm broke out and lightning sparked above the blazing building. The fire now claimed two more official deaths, one an old lady and another an elderly man who risked the flames to get a blanket. It took less than an hour for the cathedral to be gutted, and it must have been terrifying to see, as though London were the target for the wrath of God, which is actually what people believed. The lead from the cathedral roof melted, and it poured down Ludgate Hill. The new cathedral of St Paul's was built within the footprint of the one lost in the Great Fire. Designed by the brilliant architect Sir Christopher Wren, it's one of the most famous landmarks in Britain. But hidden in the cathedral gardens, there's a secret hardly anyone knows about. Looking forward to this. Underground, a small part of the original cathedral still survives, and I have a unique opportunity to see it. So this is it, this is the, uh, the doorway to the crypt. Can we have a look? Underneath this manhole cover are the last fragments of the original crypt from 1666, and apparently no one's been down here for decades. So actually, when you look down there, it's pretty dark and grim and looks a bit musty, but, well, <sighs> let's see for myself. Ooh. Oh, God, it's... A bit of a tight squeeze to get down it, actually. Oh. Wow. When you're down, this is pretty amazing, because here we are underneath St Paul's, one of the great landmarks of London, one of the great landmark buildings of the world, and we can see something almost no one gets a chance to see, the pillars of medieval St Paul's. And we can also see over here what look like scorch marks, these black marks on the stone. And it's amazing to think that those have been made by the Great Fire itself. But what you've also got to imagine is London's booksellers and Joshua Curtin placing their stock down here while the Great Fire was building, hoping against hope that all of their books, which were their livelihood, were going to be safe. And then think of them back on street level as the flames were you know, eating the city around them, hoping that all of their precious stock down here was going to be safe. It's incredible. 
Their hopes were dashed. Everything was destroyed. It's good down here, but I'm off to the land of the living. The burning of St Paul's, London's most significant religious building, shocked the city. But it also brought out the dark heart of Londoners, because someone surely had to take the blame. Surprisingly, the first to be accused was not the Pudding Lane baker, Thomas Farriner. Instead, people wanted to blame foreigners for starting the fire. You have to remember that 17th century London was a social powder keg. A spark could set it off at any time. Three days into the fire, a mob of enraged Londoners took to the streets following a rumour of a Dutch invasion. The city was descending into chaos. Human beings on the whole they like there to be a culprit and they like to catch the culprit. And so who were the prime suspects? Number one is the Dutch, we're at war with them. Number two, we're also at war with the French, and the French are worse than the Dutch because they're Catholic. And the third are Catholics in general, the homegrown traditional English threat that actually had produced the gunpowder plot and are therefore capable of atrocity on a grand scale. During the third day of the fire, reports were coming in of a mob running amok, picking on innocent victims. I think the worst case uh, for me is uh, a woman with an apron full of chicks, little chickens, in Moorfields. Some nutcase thought that she was carrying fireballs in her apron. She'd been throwing them around. And a mob just got this idea, set on her the clubs and cut her breasts off. They pretty well literally went mad. Coming up next, we find out more about why the most obvious of culprits, the Pudding Lane Baker himself, Mr. Farriner managed to dodge the wrath of Londoners, and we discover who actually ended up paying the ultimate price for starting the Great Fire of London. Welcome back to the Great Fire of London. It's now early evening on Tuesday the 4th of September, the third day of the Great Fire. St Paul's is still in flames, and so is the city's economy. In this mad panic, Londoners cast the net widely for someone to blame. Against all common sense, Thomas Farriner, the baker from the Pudding Lane area, is not the first to be accused. And when he finally has to answer for himself, he quickly points the finger at someone else. Thomas Farriner turned out to be a master at passing the buck. And you can imagine his delight when the authorities began turning up the heat on a 26-year-old watchmaker's son from Normandy called Robert Huber. Huber was French, he claimed to be Catholic, and like many terrified foreigners, he was fleeing the country when he was caught. None of that boded well, but the thing that really damned him was when asked about who started the Great Fire of London, he confessed. It wasn't long before Robert Hubert was on trial and facing the death penalty, and Farriner was off the hook. Amazingly, a record of Hubert's trial still exists. It's kept here at the London Metropolitan Archives, and I've been granted special permission to see it. Dr Jacob Field is a specialist on this period and knows all about poor Robert Hubert. Jacob, what do we have here? So we have a document here, 350 years old, which is the original trial record of the case against Robert Hubert, the man accused of starting the Great Fire of London. Well, what does it say? So it says here in Latin, which was used in legal records at the time, that Robert Hubert, uh, lately of London, a labourer, diabolically, voluntarily, maliciously and feloniously started the Great Fire by putting a fireball through the window of a bakery on Pudding Lane. Why did he confess? Well, this is where the story becomes quite sad and a little tragic. Robert Hubert was someone who was mentally unbalanced, and it's very likely uh, that he did it for attention. But if, at a distance of 350 years, you can judge that he probably um, wasn't in a fit mental state mm. to give a confession like this, why did they believe him? Well, really, they were looking for someone to blame. And also, there was another figure who stood to gain by this confession. So have a look at the signatures uh, under the indictment. And these are the people basically saying that this is true and this is what happened. So whose names do you see there? Thomas Farriner. 
Thomas Farriner, the baker. Yes, this is Thomas Farriner, the elder uh, baker who lives on Pudding Lane. And if you look at some other names, who else do you see? We've got Hannah Farriner and Thomas Farriner Jr. So the whole Farriner family is testifying against him. So it's, that's right. So all of the Farriners are basically coming to court and saying, we had nothing to do with this. There's no way it's our fault that the fire started. And this man, Robert Hubert, started it all with throwing a fireball through our window. So they're behind this miscarriage of justice. They really are the bakers from hell, aren't they? They don't come out of this well at all. Robert Hubert paid the ultimate price and was hanged at Tyburn Gallows on the 29th of October, 1666. The Great Fire of London had claimed yet another victim. So who'd have thought the Farriners could be so evil? Yes, they must have thanked their lucky stars that poor Robert Hubert was so mentally disturbed that he confessed to starting the fire. And just because they'd signed the indictment didn't mean they'd actually witnessed anything. No, no, it just meant that they were trying to escape being blamed for starting the blaze. They got away with it scot-free. With St Paul's crumbling in flames, the fire now gets as far as the law courts at Temple. This is over a mile and a half from the Pudding Lane area where it began. And the fire just keeps spreading. But now the fire's coming towards me, heading west along the Strand. The King's brother, the Duke of York, is struggling desperately to fight it. And all around here, houses are being torn down to stop the fire from spreading any further down there, towards the King's Palace at Whitehall. We've already seen our banker, Robert Viner, and our bookseller, Joshua Curtin, watch their homes and businesses go up in smoke and flames. Now our third Londoner, shoemaker Sybil Tame, is the last to be caught by the blaze. Sybil Tame was a widow who lived and worked at Christ Hospital School, making shoes for orphan children. When the fire started, her workshop was located over a mile away from the epicentre of the blaze. Living on the western edge of the city, she must have thought she was safe from harm. But by Tuesday evening, things had taken a turn for the worse. Sybil was so incredibly unlucky. Her workshop caught a few of the last embers from the fire and was engulfed by flames. She must have assumed the fire wouldn't reach her, as we know she'd done nothing to move her things out of harm's way. Or maybe she just couldn't afford the exorbitant rates carters were demanding to move people's things. Sybil lost everything. Her home, her livelihood, even her tools. Sharing the same fate as thousands of destitute Londoners, she now had to find another way to provide for herself and her daughters. It's now the end of the third day, and all over London, the fire isn't showing any signs of slowing down. I've come to the eastern part of the city, to one of Britain's greatest landmarks, the Tower of London. Now, at the time of the Great Fire, this place was already nearly 600 years old, but so far, it had escaped any damage because strong winds have been blowing the fire west through the city, where it's been devouring everything in its path. But on the evening of Tuesday, the 4th of September, the wind changes direction. Now blowing from west to east, the fire is heading straight for the Tower of London. Not only is the tower a symbol of security for the whole nation, it's actually a massive ammunition store. There are over 9,000 barrels of gunpowder in there. If the Great Fire reaches the tower, it's going to go up in one vast, terrifying explosion. For Londoners, this has been the worst day so far. Their beloved city is being consumed before their eyes. It's been incredible to see the temperatures the Great Fire reached. And you really have to feel for those ordinary Londoners whose lives were ripped apart by the fire. No one seemed safe. But the Great Fire isn't done yet. Join us next time to find out how it changed Britain forever. That's hot. We'll find out why fire breaks could be worse than useless. Oh, there it goes again. We'll investigate how many people actually 
actually died in the blaze. My belief is that hundreds, possibly even thousands of people died in the fire of London. And we'll discover what happened to the Tower of London and trace the fire's final moments. This is the point where the Great Fire of London stopped.